Hello and welcome to On the Sunny Side. I'm Sunny Grinneveld. I'm an entrepreneur and an under 30 list maker on Forbes list. And I interview every week an On the Sunny Side digital leaders, meaning researchers, executives, and entrepreneurs who are shaping the digital economy and who are using technology to drive the greater good in this world, who are using tech for good. Today, I'm very excited about welcoming Professor Sandra Matz to On the Sunny Side. She is a professor of management at the Columbia Business School in New York, where she's known to take a big data approach towards researching human behavior in a variety of business domains. Now, she has been recognized as a Data IQ's 100 most influential people in data-driven marketing, and I'm incredibly honored to have her here on the show. Welcome, Sandra. Hi, Sunny. Thanks for having me. Well, um, for many who watch the show regularly, they know that I tend to start the show with something I call Sunny's Fast Five. And um, basically it's five questions where I hope that my guest answers within more or less one sentence. Um, would you be ready for that? That's great, go ahead. <laughs> All right, so first question's uh, super easy. Are you a morning or a night person? Definitely not a morning person. Um, so I love my sleep. If anything, I guess a night person. And if you would have a time machine and we would travel back together to December 3rd, 2016, could you explain why to you particularly this is a special date that you referenced in a TEDx talk? Um, it, it's definitely a day that I, that I remember. Um, it was the day that one of the um, stories around Cambridge Analytica broke. So the first time that this was mentioned in one of the Swiss outlets, that's magazine, it featured my research and it was a day that I was just overwhelmed with emails, Facebook messages, um, of people asking about my involvement in the science behind it. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. I'm also going to link that TEDx talk for anybody who's curious to dive into that uh, into the comment section of YouTube, but uh, onwards to the next uh, fast question. Uh, you are a researcher at heart, and the interesting thing I always like to ask researchers is what is the big question, the unsolved question of your field that you are most excited about? I mean, there's so many questions I think that are still out there now that we have all the technology to, to trace people and see what people are up to on a daily, daily basis. I think the one research question that I've recently become super interested in is um, how hiring female CEOs actually changes company language such that women are associated more with the gender terms. So really the idea that we're changing the gendering of language by hiring women into positions of power. And one TEDx talk, you gave two TEDx talks. I've already referenced the first one, but you gave another one on um, can money buy happiness? And if so, how does that quite work out? Um, I found your, your research that you presented in that talk, I'm also gonna link it in the YouTube se section, super interesting. Uh, I'd like to ask you, what does success mean for you? It's a, it's a tough one, because um, like as you mentioned before, I think academics are mostly focused on, let's push some research out and let's publish papers. But I think it, it sounds cliche, but for me, like actually having people that I love to celebrate success with, I think is the, is the biggest accomplishment of all, because everything else just becomes much less meaningful when you think about the bigger picture. Let's dive into you know, some of the, the fundamentals of your research. I mean, you're very known for something called psychological targeting. Could you explain to the audience, for those who are not familiar with the field and, and the simplest of terms, so, uh, what is that? If you were to put it in a nutshell, it's essentially the science behind what Cambridge Analytica presumably did. Um, but what it means is that we're trying to predict people's psychological traits from their digital footprint, so the traces that they leave online on a daily basis, and then using those insights to come up with customized interventions in the context of marketing and, and so on. 
And how does that work specifically? I mean, you're at a, a business school, so presumably there's a lot of applications in the business field. How does it, how does psychological targeting work? Yeah, so I mean, the, the one interesting thing is that my background is, is actually in psychology. So I was kind of trained as a, as a classical psychologist interested in human behavior. Like, what is it that people do on a daily basis? How do their preferences, motivations manifest? and then gradually transition to like a, a business context. And what you saw there when I joined is that most of the targeting was based on social demographics or behavioral um, input. So you would be targeted because you're a woman of a certain age or because you've searched for something specific or bought something specific in the past. And the idea of psychological targeting is essentially that we want to <clears throat> kind of see and treat the consumer more holistically. So the idea that we're not just looking at what have they done in the past, who are they in terms of their social demographics, um, but what are their psychological needs, preferences, and motivations. And for a long time, that was really difficult because the only way that we could get at people's psychological traits and characteristics was to give them a questionnaire. So we would ask them, like, how much do you agree with the statements, I'm the life of the party, and then we'd conclude whether they were extroverted or introverted. Um, but you can also imagine that that's nice for researchers in the lab, but it just doesn't work in the real world. It doesn't work to, to scale that to real world business context. So the, really the, the breakthrough in terms of psychological targeting when, was when we had the ability to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to look at what someone is doing online. So there could be their credit card spending, their Facebook likes, their smartphone sensing data, and, and turn that into psychological profiles. And now what you do, what you have the chance to do is you can say, okay, this is an extroverted person. We know that based on their behavior, like what are the things that they might be interested in in terms of products? What are the messages that most might be most appealing to them um, in order to persuade them to buy something or to take specific actions? If you are a small business that is trying to increase online sales and online marketing, how do you get started? I think so. So psychological targeting is still pretty much in its infancy, right? In the beginning, it was pretty difficult for companies to say, we do want to treat our customers holistically, but how do we get from data that we hold about them, about what they did in the past, who they are, to something more that resembles more of a psychological profile? Now, there's more and more companies that offer psychological profiles based on emails, based on customer data. But the one thing that... Um, I think is what matters the most to me. And it's one recommendation that I give to all companies, large and small. And um, it does matter a little bit more to the, to the small companies, to be honest, because they might not have the resources to necessarily easily scale in, but make it a conversation. Like don't just passively assess the psychological profiles of your consumers, like behind their backs, kind of in, in a very opaque way that doesn't, doesn't give them the opportunity to see what's really happening, but include them in the journey. Make it part of the value proposition, right? Most companies do want to serve their customers. So tell that to your customers. Tell them, look, we're trying everything we can to best serve your needs. But for us to be able to do that, we need some information to kind of see what is it that you're interested in, what are your preferences, what are your motivations, like help us either by giving us access to the data or potentially even completing short surveys, right? So not everybody has the opportunity to take data to predict psychological profiles, but if you have an open dialogue with your customers, they might be able to, to give you that information that you need. And then it really becomes this win-win where you can tell your customer, we're going to improve services a lot if you kind of give us some insights into, into what you want, and please feel free to interact with the profiles. So right now, again, like most companies just say, I'm gonna predict that Sunny is extroverted and open-minded, and if I get this wrong, then the entire value proposition uh, goes down the drain, right? So I got it wrong, you're not getting a good service, and I'm not actually being the most efficient in terms of my marketing and the way that I design my product. If you have the chance to engage with that and tell me, I don't agree that I'm the most extroverted person in this context, and um, let me change that, then we're both better off. You have a lot more control and I have a much better profile. So it's really, I think, all about transparency and having this, this dialogue between companies and consumers. One particular area where people uh, do have concern and increasing concern is when it comes to the combination of using psychological targeting and the data that I might be sharing, the likes that I might be sharing, and combining that with uh, political orientation. And I mean, you, you referenced this one article that came out on, on December 3rd, 2016, but 
and I think that must be on one hand sort of something super positive as a researcher to have so much attention given to your field. But on the other hand, it's received quite a bad reputation and people are somewhat afraid of sort of the risks involved uh, of psychological targeting. What are some of the common misconceptions? And I think you're absolutely right in that. It was like December 3rd was definitely a day that was very anxiety inducing, like back as a grad student, what did I know about talking um, to the media? But it was also to some extent extremely liberating um, because we had been trying for years to raise awareness, right? So we had been going into schools, we had been trying to talk to the media, we had been trying to talk to policymakers and tell them, look, here's a technology that is actually able to predict really intimate traits based on data that's publicly available and that's out there. So the fact that people suddenly started to care about the topic was amazing. Um, and the fact that people now have a much better sense of like what are the challenges associated with psychological targeting, I think is going to benefit everybody. And um, I do think the one misconception or the one thing that I would like to see in, in the media kind of being used differently is the fact that right now the conversation is very black and white. So it's like some people say, oh, this is a new wonder weapon, this is going to change everything. Um, and then the other side is like, this is a complete hoax, it doesn't work at all. Um, very, <laughs> very rarely in life is um, are things as black and white as the way that the media is portraying this. And I think we really need to kind of get down to this discussion of, well, you're not gonna turn a convinced Hillary voter suddenly into a Trump supporter just because you use psychological targeting, that's nonsense. Um, but it is true that we can actually shift behavior and we can push people in a certain direction just because it resonates with, with our psychological motivations. So I think this idea that it's either or, um, it doesn't work or it's a wonder weapon, this is totally outdated. And the conversation that I would much rather see happening is assume that it works, assume that it's effective, how do we want to regulate it? How do we want to regulate it? And how do we actually want to use it such that we're not just focusing on, on the negative sides? Some of what on the sunny side is about is to really have this type of dialogue, to have this type of conversation, to recognize that these technologies are here, they're tools, but you know, how do we make sure that we really use them to advance the greater good in this world? And so, you know, as someone who's been there from the very beginning of this technology and really has followed it step by step and still is shaping it in many ways, you know, how do we make sure that we do use psychological targeting for good? I think, this, in my opinion, that's uh, one of the most important questions to ask. And it's also one of the um, most difficult questions to answer if you want. And um, so I do think, first of all, like the way that it's been introduced to the media, to the public was purely negative, right? So we talk about Cambridge Analytica, very specific context um, in, the, in, in the context of political campaigns. Now you could imagine psychological targeting being used in other contexts, um, education, like trying people to have, um, help, trying to help people save more money, which is some of the, the studies that we're currently running. Um, and for that to happen, you actually have step back and think about what is the what is the main idea behind psychological targeting and it's really this like how can I connect to the other side in a way that we typically connect on an interpersonal level right so if we talk like I have a certain idea of like who you are what you like and how you communicate what are you interested in and to some extent that all got lost in the in the digital world because it was just a bunch of numbers and um, now okay, sure. We're now doing this interview with a little puppy and um, he's just come back. <laughs> Aww, <laughs> that is something. Was he already there before uh, COVID-19 or is he part of uh, the COVID-19 measures in, uh, in your house? No, no, I think she was there two years before. I think this is the classic kid walks in, in this case, a uh, puppy. <laughs> no. Awesome. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, that's very cute. So I think it's really this idea that like where can we where can we use it and how can we just leverage this idea that we can connect to someone even if it's at scale even if we're not in the same room face to face um, and then use that power to drive the behaviors that we want to see and it's difficult to do that but there's a bunch of technological um, solutions where you don't have to send all of your data to the cloud you could potentially use your 
mobile phones or local devices to learn something and then give you personalized services. So I think it, there's definitely like ways in which to do that. It's just that we're not having this discussion right now. So are you, I mean, I find education, I, I'm an educator myself, and I mean, I find that fascinating because I mean, it really, there is no one size fits all in education. Are you saying that psychological targeting, if used properly, could actually, for example, help um, personalize uh, some of the, the, the educational lessons that, that children and, and, well, even potentially executives let later down the line receive? Do you, you think that would be possible? I, so I definitely think it's possible. I'm currently working um, with a startup in, in Montreal, and what they're trying to do is see, because it's a college job, but it's a huge issue in the mm -hmm. US and Canada. So a lot of students start their degree, um, they pay a ton of money to take classes and earn a degree, but they drop out having, without having anything and having wasted a lot of money. So what we're trying to do is say, first of all, can we predict based on people's digital footprints, what is it that they do at university, when they're most likely to drop out so that we can help them get personalized support. But you could also imagine that people learn differently, right? So some people learn when they have like visual information and they, everything has to be a story. And some people are like, just give me the facts and this is how I, how I learn the best. So knowing cognitive styles, for example, of people already helps us a lot in trying to see how do we present materials? How do we make learning interesting and engaging? I, f I find that, that fascinating. I, I, I wish I could continue the conversation, but um, I just want to close with, with two short questions. Um, number one, for people who really want to dive more deeply in this field, are there any particular resources that you would give someone who wants to get a head start on it? I mean, so there's, as I said in the beginning, like psychological targeting is in its infancy, just so there's very little on that specific topic. There's two books that I think are incredible at dealing with the broader topic of data privacy. One is Permanent Records of Ed Snowden. So that mm -hmm. really brought this um, point home for me is like, we do care about privacy. So this myth of privacy is dead. Um, if you don't have anything to hide, you shouldn't really worry about your data being out there. Uh, incredible book. And then the other one is um, Everybody Lies by Seth Stevens Davidovich. And what he talks about is Google searches. So the fact mm -hmm. Like we reveal a bunch of information about ourselves um, in a seemingly um, secret, secret space. Thank you so much for the recommendations. I'm going to link them for anybody who's watching. I'm going to link them also in the description. Uh, one last question. What are reasons that you are hopeful for that future, that we do end up using this technology predominantly to advance the greater good in society? So I think it's, it's essentially the young people. And it's amazing, I mean, with everything happening in the US right now, right, there's protests, there's riots, there's like very systemic inequality, but what it does is it mobilizes people. Um, and it especially mobilizes the young people who, are, who grew up with the technology, who have a much better sense of what's possible, like what are the upsides, what are the downsides, just because they understand what's, what's behind it. So my sense is in pretty much any, um, aspect of life, whether that's politics, whether that's technology, I really feel like once young people speak up and they voice their opinion and they force policymakers to listen, I think that's what is going to hopefully save us all. Those are beautiful closing words. I truly hope that too. And thank you so, so much, Sandra, for taking your time, for uh, the energy that you're putting into this field um, and for continuing the good fight, because I think it's so important that we make sure these, these tools uh, do end up advancing things for the better. The Sunny Side will be back on Thursday at 4 p.m. Right now at 5.30 on this channel, you'll see Klaus Fiala, the editor-in-chief of the German-speaking edition of Forbes, having uh, his interview and his show, uh, The Greatest Business Minds. Tune in for that, and I look forward to seeing you on Thursday at 4 p.m. next week on The Sunny Side.